we have been using strings all the time already, so there's in fact maybe not so much new here, but just a, a few more ways to dealing with strings and manipulating them in particular. So strings are usually defined as sequences of characters. Characters can be anything that is available on your keyboard, so all the letters, numbers, exclamation marks, arithmetic operators, all of these are characters. Therefore, thereby, a string is naturally thought of as a sequence of these characters. However, sequence is a little bit too close to lists, right? Because you can access a certain element of a list and maybe change it. Therefore, in Python from now on, we should agree that whenever we see a string, we think of it as a tuple of the characters, because tuples are immutable, and it turns out strings are immutable as well. So it's much easier to think of tuples instead of lists when we start talking about strings. Strings can be defined in various ways, and they are just listed here. So we give a name to a variable, let's call it string1, assignment operator, and then I have here a single quote, and everything that is inside this quote will define a string. Now you might ask the question, why is there a single quote and not a double quote as I've done before? It turns out you can actually use both interchangeably. And the reason why there are different ways of defining strings is the following. If we use a single quote for starting the definition of a string, of course we have to use a single quote for ending it. So the definition of the string will end here. Right? This is where the Python interpreter decides, well, I now need to stop, the string has been defined. But because I used single quotes for defining this particular string, I'm actually free to use double quotes inside it. Okay, so that's the important difference. We can use double quotes inside strings that are defined using single quotes. And the complete opposite applies to double quotes. So that's the syntax that we have used so far. If I define a string using double quote, the definition starts here and it ends here with the next appearance of a double quote. But this allows me to use single quotes inside. Okay, so depending on what you want to write into your string, it might be worth changing the de definition of the string, changing the character you use for defining a string. Now likewise, you can in fact use three single quotes, one after the other, to define a string, which allows you to put everything inside, like single quotes, double quotes, and even new line characters. So what I have here is a string, which has a line break. Let's just try this out in, in Spider, how this looks like when I print it. And now, of course, um, this command window breaks strings automatically if they do not fit into the length. But you see that in my definition of the string is now an invisible character, actually, here, which is not printed out, which corresponds to the enter key. Right? So the enter key is just a character in the string, which tells Python, here is a new line of our string. And indeed, it then continues on the next line. So new lines can be included if you use the triple quotes for string definition. And you can also use triple double quotes. And that's very much the syntax we used for doc strings, right? So doc strings are just strings which are not assigned to a particular variable. And in doc strings, you can type anything you like. Of course, you're not allowed to type triple double quotes inside a doc string because this would end the corresponding string. Right? But anything else is allowed. Now, there are some special characters which are defined using a backslash, and one, a few of them are shown here. If you have a string like this, and inside the string you have a double backslash like so, then Python knows that you want to just print out one of them. This is called masking. Okay. So what we do is we take this backslash here, we want to print it, but if you actually remove the second one here, you will get something which you didn't necessarily expect. So in order to produce a backslash, you need to use a double backslash in the definition of a string. And this masking actually allows us to use double quotes 
inside strings that are defined using double quotes. Look at this example here. I'm starting a string definition with a double quote. I'm not allowed to use double quotes inside my string unless I mask them. So a small trick is to just put the backslash before them and this will define a perfectly valid string which contains double quotes inside it. Okay, there we go. And of course removing these um, will result in an error because now the interpreter will think that the string actually ends here and then it will not know what to do with this part of the string. Likewise, you can also mask single quotes using backslash inside the definition of a string using single quotes. And another special character is backslash n, which produces a new line character in your string. So let's try this one. So line, 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 something like this. What will this output? Well, it will print line, then essentially press the enter key three times for you and then output hello at the end. So these are special characters and there are others. If you are interested in learning a few more, there is an official reference which lists them all. But these are the most important ones we shall be using. If you need to put multiple backslashes inside a string, then of course this become, can come, become very inconvenient. Let's say I want to produce 10 backslashes, then because every two of them is interpreted as a single backslash, I have to type 20 backslashes here, right? So in order to prevent this, you can define what is called a raw string. Raw strings are defined as strings, like before, but you just put an R in front of it. Now everything that is inside the string is taken literally and will be printed out as it was defined. So you can see the outputs here. Um, the double backslash is now no longer condensed into a single one. It's really outputted as a double backslash. The print function naturally takes a string and prints it out, out on the command line. And this was our very first Python program, right? So here already we use the definition of a string in combination with the print function. We have also learned about the input keyword or the input function. It always returns a string as the argument. And we have also seen how to concatenate string inside the print function using commas. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on the application, when you use the syntax with a comma, Python will put a space between the two strings. You can see this here. I'm printing here is your string colon. String definition ends, so no space, comma x. And what happens when you output this is there is one space being inserted by the interpreter. Now, sometimes we do not want this space. Uh, what we have to do in this context is we have to use concatenation using plus. So two strings can be concatenated using the plus operator. And this will fail, however, if what you try to concatenate is not a string. So if you want to concatenate a string with another string, which represents a number, you first need to convert it into a string using the str keyword. We have also seen this before. This is the conversion to string. Now this, of course, fails if there is something inside your string which cannot be converted to another data type. So here is a string that contains something, so a few numbers and plus, and a decimal point. And when I try to convert this to float, I get an error because this particular string is not a representation of a floating point number. Now, once strings are defined, we can use the tuple operations on them almost in a straightforward manner. So we can access the first character in a string using square brackets, zero. We can get the first six characters like so, or we can get the characters with indices seven to nine. Again, remember that counting starts at zero, so the first character in a string will be with index zero. We can get the last five characters and so on. So the outputs are shown here. 
of course the first character of the first string x which is python is hard is just p so this returns a new string with just one character what else can be done um, you can of course take subsets of strings like so so this will here this will re return the first nine characters in the string concatenated with another string containing not space not to be precise and then using the remaining characters in the string and appending it and what you get out of this is that we have inserted not into our string x so we end up with python is not hard of course we need to count the right position nine happens to be the position where we have to insert not um, that's exactly the ninth character here we can multiply strings by numbers as shown here so if you take a string just containing a single dot and you multiply it by 17 not surprisingly you get 17 dots easily without typing them manually now what is not possible is to change a character in a string so you cannot take a string x and modify the character at index 1 this is because these are immutable objects like tuples cannot be modified You can also not sort the characters in a string because again this would amount to swapping their order which is not allowed but all of these can be done if you convert the string to another object that can be sorted or inserted in and the most natural candidate for these are lists so if you take a string x and you apply to it the sorted function What you get is the following you get a list of characters being sorted alphabetically so in my string python is not hard turns out there are three spaces here which appear first in the alphabet so the first three elements in my list are just single character strings containing spaces then we get all the capital letters because they appear in the internal enumeration before the lowercase letters so we get the p here and then the rest are all the letters in my string alphabetically sorted so just to remind you this is how we did in place sorting of lists right just taking a list and applying the sort function to it this will not work because a string cannot be sorted in place because it would it's immutable Whereas this syntax here works perfectly fine because it returns something else that can in fact be sorted, namely a list. So the sorting uh, or the sorted function returns a list. Let's say we want to sort all the characters in a string, but then put them back into a single string. For this, we use the join function. So the join function is a funny one because it's the syntax is a bit unnatural, I would say, at first sight, because it is a function of an empty string or any string you want to use for the joining. So in fact, let's try this out. I have my string here, Python is not hard, and I create a sorted list, LST, like so, as we've just seen before. And now I take this list, I put it into the argument of the join function. And the join function is in fact a function of a string. So in this case, I just use an empty string. And then we print out the result. And what we now get is a string which contains exactly the characters of the list that we have seen before, but joined together into a single string. Now, what can I do with this? Instead of joining all of these characters using an empty string, I can separate them, let's say, by colons, if I want. So this takes all the characters of the string and joins them using colon separators. And it can be anything you like, so you can join them with any character. Okay. So take some time to get used to remember that the joining character is first and then you have a function of this joining character called join which takes as an input a list 
but that's how Python works. We have joint strings, we have joint lists into a single string. You can also do the opposite using the split function. So if I have a string like so, um, 17 semicolon, 19 semicolon, 23, I can take the string and split it exactly at these semicolon characters. And this returns a list. And the entries of this list are strings, right? They are not integers, they are strings because we started with the string. This is very useful for several applications. So let's say you have a timestamp, so 5 o'clock in the evening, and you want to get the hours, minutes, and seconds. Well, you can do this easily by just splitting the string using the colon, and you get a list where the first element in that list would correspond to the hours, the second one correspond to the minutes, and this one would correspond to the seconds. If you just want the list of all the characters in a string, one character at a time, you can call the list function on a string, which will produce that list of single character elements. Here is a list of a few more functions that can be applied with strings. So you can get the length of a string using len of x. You can capitalize the first character. This is sometimes useful if you ask, for example, for a username. And some people are sloppy. They are actually not capitalizing their own names. Uh, you can do this automatically using the capitalize function. So here's an example. This is a string with several words. And if I call x dot capitalize, this produces a new string. It must be a new string because x is immutable. And when I print, print this string, it should start with a capital T. You can check whether a string ends with another substring. So we can check if x ends with the characters ORDS which is clearly the case here, right? Um, ends with these characters, therefore we get true. But it's important to remember that this is case sensitive. So if you check if this string, string ends with OR capital DS, you will get a false because capital D and small d are different in Python, so therefore um, the word does not end with this particular character. Neither does it end with word because it actually ends with S, right? The last characters need to coincide. So we get false in these two cases. We can replace a string. So let's try this one. So I'll take my original uh, string X, I capitalize it, and then I replace the word a string with x. Okay. And I print out the result. Okay, so this is x with several words, right? It does exactly what we expect. It will replace all of these. And it does this several times. So if a certain phrase occurs multiple times in your string, it will replace all the occurrences, not just the first one. You can check if a certain string is a contained in another string, again using the in keyword. Right? So we can see if, for example, the string ring is a substring of our string, and this is the case because it's here. So this returns true. And you can also find the position of a substring using the find function. And check whether all the characters are low, low key characters, so is lower it's the corresponding function to use. This is just a small list of all the functions that are available and uh, a full list of these is in the Python documentation. So I, I don't know, there must be hundreds of these. Right? So it's impossible to list them all, but you should know where to look for them. There's a link here which lists all the available functions for you.
Regular expressions, something that I'm not going to cover in this course. Regular expressions are a way to formally define character sequences and check whether a certain character sequence matches a certain pattern. So you're all familiar with email addresses, right? So what is the format of an email address? Well, at the beginning you have at least one character, right? which might be a letter or a number. Then at some point in a, and there are no spaces in an email address, right? At some point in your email address, you have the at character. After at, you have the domain of the web server or your email provider. Then you have a full stop dot, and then you have a top level domain. Okay, so there are certain components that are part of any email address. Now, given an email address provided by a user, let's say from some input form, because we have asked them for the email address, how do we check if this is in fact a valid email address? Well, you have to basically check all of these rules. It starts with a character or a number. It somewhere has an at statement in it, and it has a domain and a top-level domain. And the Pythonic way, or in fact, the proper way of checking whether strings um, have a certain structure is via regular expressions. There is a module called RE for that, and if you ha ever happen to use it, um, the reference is given here. I'm not covering regular expressions because they can look very scary. So the formal definition of whether an email address is correct or not um, is given here. Okay. So this is what is called a regular expression. And there are functions that will use, will take a string as an input, this particular expression, and then they will tell you this actually matches the format of an email address, therefore it is a valid one or not. But you see, they look horrible, I think very difficult to read uh, by humans, but um, this exactly specifies what an email address has to look like. And it's actually more complicated than you would think. Right? Email addresses usually look very regular, um, but there can be many exceptions, so it's not so straightforward to verify that. Not going to be part of this course. So far we have used very primitive way of concatenating strings when we wanted to output, let's say, a fixed string with a variable value, like so. For example, when we type x is equal to something, we defined a string, then maybe we used a comma, and then comma x, and this will pro produce the output of this form. Now, in several there are several reasons why this is not very convenient. The most important one being that whenever we use the concatenation using plus, we need to convert variables into strings, otherwise we get an error. And it's very limited because, let's say we have a floating point number representing pi, and we only want to print out the first three decimal places. How do we tell Python to only output the number to a certain digit. It turns out it's very difficult without using a particular syntax, which is the so-called format function. I'm mainly covering format functions here, but just for you to know, there are at least two other ways of formatting strings in Python, so-called C-like formatting and what are called templating engines. Just for those of you who are already more familiar with Python um, and interested, please have a look at this link. But for us, format functions will be sufficient to do what we want to do. So what is the idea of a format function? It's very simple. You take a string, like so, and in the string you have certain special characters which are reserved for the format function. In this particular case, they are just the curly brackets. Okay? So it's a string containing curly brackets, comma, possibly more than one. Now this string can be put in combination with the format function and a variable x. And what Python will do is it will replace this variable x at the position where the curly brackets appeared. It's easiest to see this as an example. So let's say x is 17, just some variable. I define a string with curly brackets, and then I apply dot format of x to the string, 
and I print out the result. And what you get is the following, some string containing 17, possibly more than one. So all this does is it takes the arguments of this function and it replaces every occurrence of cur curly brackets in that string with the corresponding arguments. We can do another one, so let's have another variable string. I can have more than one curly bracket. And what you get is exactly what you might expect. The first one is, the first curly brackets is replaced with the value of x. The second curly brackets is replaced with the value of y. And you can have arbitrarily many input arguments. So here is a slightly more advanced example. The string is student curly brackets was enrolled in curly brackets where curly brackets studied curly brackets. So four curly brackets here. And I'm giving four arguments to the format function and every occurrence will be replaced by the corresponding value. Now, the format function can do much more than this. For example, instead of just listing all the arguments separated by comma, as I've done here, you see this is the start of the format function, the first argument, comma, the second argument, the third and the fourth, I can in fact give a list as an argument to that function. So here's a list called args, it has four elements, which are strings, and I can call the format function with args as an input argument, but I need to use this star here, which is called the unpacking operator. You can think of unpacking operator as taking a list and basically removing the square brackets. So if you take a list and you remove the square brackets, you're just left with comma separated values, right? And then it looks very much like what we have here. So formally, this unpacking operator takes a list and just returns all the elements one after the other. So let's try this. Okay, and what we get is a well-formatted sentence with all the list elements replaced exactly at the positions where we have curly brackets in the defining string. Now, of course, lists have an inherent order, right? The first element in the list was replaced at the position of the first curly brackets and so on. So if we change our sentence, to be no longer consistent with the list elements, uh, we get rubbish, right? So if I take the same list as before and I apply formatting with this particular list to this sentence, I get this here, which doesn't seem to be a fully formed English sentence. doesn't make any sense anymore. Is there an easy fix for this? It turns out yes. Instead of having empty curly brackets, we can provide the indices of the elements in the list. So we want at this position here to have the curly brackets being replaced by the element with index zero in the list, whereas this here should be replaced with the element of index three. Okay, the element with index three happens to be drama. So this will become Cumberbatch studied drama at the University of Manchester. Okay, gets even better than this. So instead of giving numbers which refer to indices in a list, we can also use proper names. So we can have a string of this format where we say student curly bracket, this is where the name should go, was enrolled in curly bracket, this is where I want to put the name of the university, where he or she studied some subject, right? Now, if we do this, we can use the format function with named arguments. So I have the format function here, and now this looks very familiar to us, right? These are, this is just a list of named arguments where the names correspond exactly to the strings that we have used here in the definition. Now, suddenly, of course, the order does not matter anymore. 
because Python knows I have to replace name with the argument that is given here, I have to replace uni with the argument that is given here, and so on. Now, when we think of this list of variables, name, uni, and so on, and the corresponding values, the most natural way of representing this is in form of a dictionary. Right? So this particular student maybe can be represented in form of a dictionary, where we have different types of attributes, maybe her or his name, university, whether it's a he or she, and studies. So these are the keys in my dictionary, and the corresponding values are here. So that's a dictionary with four entries. And what we can do is we can take this dictionary and give it as an argument to the format function, and it will do exactly the same. It will now replace all these curly brackets with the corresponding values having the right keys in the dictionary. The only thing to remember is that we need to unpack this dictionary using a double star operator. So that takes the dictionary and unpacks it essentially into a list of named arguments. And yeah, it should just work fine. Let's try it out. There we go, as expected. Now note that you actually do not need to use all of the keys. So I, the same thing will just work um, with this string here student name was enrolled. I'm not really using the university or the topic of study, but as long as the information is available in the dictionary, Python will just do the right thing here and replace the corresponding value at the position of the key. Now, of course, the keys have to exist. Right? So if I put something like this, and I apply the format function, Python will complain that there is no key with the name no name, so therefore it doesn't know what to replace it with, and we get the corresponding error message. There is no key with the name no name. Now this is in fact very important. This separation, what we have just done, of the data of a student and the string that formats the data is something that is used over and over again in bigger software projects. And in fact, it's used very often to produce international versions of a particular software. So let's say we, we are all running a big company, right? Manchester University Software or so, and we'll make use of the fact that we have many international students here who speak many different languages. So we can actually sell our software maybe in Wales uh, we can sell it in China, in Spain, and so on. Should we really be writing 10 different versions of our software, or should we just have one, which then, just at particular positions, replaces the corresponding outputs with the right language version? Right? Of course, we should do the second one. We should only write one software package, which can output its results in all possible languages that are required. And one way of doing this is to use dictionaries. So what I have here is a dictionary which will collect all the messages we ever want to output to the user from our software. And at the moment, I have only implemented two different languages, English and Welsh. Okay. Um, the Welsh versions are obtained using Google Translate, so if this is not correct, please forgive me. Right. And so we, what we have here is a dictionary called Messages, which has a key called Language, and the value of this key is again a dictionary. You see that? So we have a dictionary with two elements, and now this inner dictionary, which we call language, has as keys some abbreviation for the language, so let's say en for English and cy for Welsh, and then the corresponding full name of that language. That's, that's the first key value pair in messages. Then we move on. We have another key called study info, because we want to output what a particular student is studying. And again, the values of this key are a dictionary, having again two entries, one corresponding to English language. So if we want to output in English what 
a particular person is studying, we would say name studied studies at uni, whereas in Welsh we would say something else. So, and then maybe we also want to output the score that the student achieved, and we can do this in English and Welsh, and of course in pot potentially 100 other languages. Now, the data that we want to output is completely independent from the formatting. If we have a particular student, like this one here, we know they have studied a course, they had a particular name, they achieved a certain score, and, and so on. Now this little bit of code here, which I will not uh, discuss in detail, because I want you to sit down later on and try to make sense of it, it's really just taking the dictionary and filling in the correct versions. It will combine this data of a particular student with the dictionary of different language outputs that we have defined here. And it will output one sentence, or actually two sentences, uh, in English, and then the corresponding Welsh versions here. Okay. Now, if we now want to market our software in China, let's say, all we need is we need someone who speaks Chinese and can add the corresponding entries for Chinese here, and we would be done, right? Our software would now equally well work in another country. So this principle of separating out the data that you're working with, which is the argument here, this is student data, from the actual way you want to format the messages in a particular language is very important in international software development projects. What else can the format function do? It can also be used to format strings across multiple lines and in fact produce tables that are easy to look at. So let's look at an example. I have a particular string which spans multiple lines. And what I'm going to do now is I want to print this output using 40 characters of space but centered. So what we have here is curly brackets, colon, and then this hat character on your keyboard, 40. So what this corresponds to is take 40 characters and center everything within these 40 characters. It's easier to look at the output. This is the output. So centered in 40 characters will produce a string with our vertical bars, the left and the right. These here are exactly 40 characters and the text is centered within these two. Okay, so this here does corresponds to centering, whereas this corresponds to right align of the text. So that's the output that we get here. Now this poem is right aligned within 40 characters. And this is left align, of course, as you would expect. How to format numbers? Let's say we want to print pi back to the user. If we just do it, do it like given here, so we import the pi number from the math module <coughs> and we print it out, we get it returned with a certain number of digits. Let's say we want to reduce the number of digits being printed up to the fifth that's decimal place, say, then we can use this syntax here. So it's again the curly brackets as before, colon, and then we have a string of this format, 70.5f. So what does this correspond to? The 17 means that we reserve 17 spaces for printing a particular number, and the 5 means that we want to print this number with 5 decimal places, F means that it should be printed as a floating point number. Slightly longer than allowed, so this is the same string as before. You can now count, these will be exactly 17 characters, and you see that we have printed five decimal places here. Now this is of course useful if you want to print out, let's say, currencies, you only have two decimal places, let's say you want to print out prices in pound, then you want to limit the number of decimals. It can be done with the format function very easily. 
you can also insist on numbers being printed with a sign, even if the sign is positive. The corresponding syntax is here. So when I type plus 17.5f, then I will get a plus sign here when the number is positive, and I will get a minus sign when the number is negative. Just a quick uh, recap about string formatting. So what can we do with the format command that is provided by Python? It's a convenient way to mix data that we want to substitute in a string with the formatting of that string. And we can nicely separate out the data from the formatting uh, operations. So the best way to memorize this is to look at a few examples. So if we are given a string with some uh, curly brackets in it, like here, then we can call on that string the format function with an input argument, let's say x. And what Python will do is it will take this value here and substitute it at the position of the curly brackets. And this also works with multiple elements. So if you have x and y as input to your format function, then you can have two curly brackets in the string. And then, of course, the first one will be replaced by x and the second one will be replaced by y. We can use the format function also with arguments that are lists. So if lst is a variable corresponding a list, then we can use the syntax here, format star lst. So this star is called the unpacking operator. What it does is it basically takes all the elements of a list and it writes them out as a comma separated list. So that a list then becomes something of this form. And therefore, uh, we can replace consecutive curly brackets in that string with the corresponding list elements. Format also works with dictionaries. Dictionaries need to be un unpacked twice. So we have two stars here. We can use the format function to conveniently um, align strings within other strings. So for example, here I have a string with curly brackets which now have some names. So this here will be the name of a variable that I'm going to give as a named input to the formatting function. Then there's this colon, and after the colon, we have some formatting options. For example, we might want to print a name left aligned in 40 characters. Okay, so this would be the syntax for that. We might want to center. So Sorry, I mixed these two up. Uh, centering is this one. And right aligned is this one. Finally, formatting is very useful for printing out numbers in an aligned fashion. So this here, for example, will print a floating point number, which is what this F stands for in 15 characters with five decimal places. That's what this notation corresponds to. That is very convenient if you have many floating point numbers you want to print out in the table. If they end up having different lengths, it might look very messy. Whereas if you use this formatting function here, the decimal point will be aligned for all these numbers and you will get a nice output from there. Finally, a last example. So let's look at this dictionary here, which is a dictionary of the tallest and the shortest people in the world. I'm not sure it's still up to date. It might be that by now we have shorter and taller people. Uh, but anyway, uh, this dictionary contains three... So people itself is actually a list, right? So we have a list here. And each of the list entries is a dictionary. Okay. So the first person in our people list is represented by this dictionary. And each of these dictionaries has keys name, height, and status. And the corresponding values are exactly what you would expect them to be, um, with the name, the height, and whether they are alive or deceased. 
and we can easily now add more people to this list if we wanted to. What I want to illustrate here is how we now produce a table of this form here. You see the names in this table are left aligned and although these names have different lengths, when I print out the table, they all get the same space reserved for them. Therefore, everything is nicely aligned. So the way this is done is very simple. We just use curly bracket name and then left aligned in 21 characters. Okay. So this part here of the formatting string makes sure that the name is printed in 21 characters for each of them. So any space that is not used up will be filled um, with empty characters. Then we have printed out space, vertical bar space. So that's, this produces these strings here. And now we print out the height of each of the people using 11 characters with one decimal point. And they are floating point numbers, so I need to tell this to Python. And the corresponding variable in my dictionary is called height. Okay, so that's why I named the variable height. We print out another vertical bar and we also print out status. And this will be eight characters centered. And you see um, these are indeed centered. Okay, life is slightly uh, indented here. And now the way to do this, uh, one after the other going through our list. I have here a for loop. Remember, lists are iteratable, so I can loop over them. I take out each person from the people list, and each of these persons is a dictionary. Therefore, I need to unpack it twice when I want to give it to the format function. Does this make sense? So a very convenient way to format strings and align them in tables, yes? When you're printing up the uh, home name, you have zero, one, and two for, I guess, home numbers. Where is the point of that? This one here, is, yeah. yeah. So this produces the header of the table, yeah, yeah. which is this one here. Now, I just want to make sure that the header has the same space. Each of the columns of the header has the same space as what we have in the table. So I'm printing out um, the first argument that is given to the format function, left aligned in 21 characters. And the first argument that I'm given is just a string with content name. So this will print out name, but then it will reserve 21 characters. Okay, so I don't need to worry about producing these spaces manually. <coughs> then again, here we have a vertical bar. Now I print out the second argument, which is the one with index 1, given to the format function, which is just, just saying height in centimeters. And this here is the third argument with index 2, given to the format function, which is this string here. So it's another way to call the format function. You can also give it the indices of um, the arguments in the argument list. Is it possible to just uh, stick the string in there without Yes, you could do this. Uh, you would not need any indices here, but uh, this was just for illustration. So there are different ways of doing the same thing. Right. Okay, uh, the format function can do many other things. If you're interested in any of this, there's a link to the official documentation where you can read more on that topic. I want to briefly mention another way of formatting string, not because I encourage you to use it, but just because it's more handy, a shorter notation, and I sometimes use it in the lecture notes because of convenience. Okay. So this is the so-called C-like formatting. If you know about C, then you might have seen this before. It works as follows. We are just given a string, let's say, of this form, pi to the fifth decimal, and then we have this percentage operator, and then some formatting information here, which is very similar to what the format function understands. Then after the string, we are not using the format function, we are just using this operator here, and then the corresponding variable we want to substitute. So this variable pi is going to be substituted in that position starting from the percentage sign in the string, and it's going to be printed with five decimal places after the comma. This is the so-called uh, C-like formatting. We can also print a number 
in 17 characters using five decimal places. And again, no call to format here. I'm just using percent and then the variable name and so on. So these parts here are exactly the same as the one that the format function understands, but we are just using here this operator in order to tell the variable names to the string. So this will produce these outputs here. Let's look at just one of them, maybe this one here. Pi in 17 characters to the fifth decimal with a sign. How has this been produced? It has been produced by this statement here. So if I type percent plus 17.5f, it will print a floating point number in 17 characters with five decimal places and the sign plus or minus prepended to the number. Okay. So we know that pi is positive, but now it's explicitly printed out, out as a positive number here. Um, as I mentioned before, this is much shorter than using the format function, but it's kind of considered out of date, at least within Python, so I would encourage you to better use the format function if you have a choice. Okay. Now I'd like to talk a bit about generators and generator expressions. And in order to do so, we need to make clear in our minds um, distinctions between three different terms that we will be using from now on very often. So first of all, um, there is the notion of an iterator. Okay. An iterator is, abstractly speaking, an object which represents some kind of data which is streamed. So streaming here means that you somehow get the first element of that data and then you have some way to get the second one, the third one, and so on. So we don't have the data all at once. We get it one piece after the other. That's why it's called a stream. And objects that represent such data streams are called iterators. That's the first term. The second term is a generator. A generator is a function in the sense of a standard Python function that returns an iterator. So a function that can provide us with a stream of data. And finally, there is something which is called a generator expression, which is a line of Python code that also returns an iterator just as generators do, but in a single line. Okay. These are called generator expressions. Now, iterators are a very powerful concept, and they're far too complex to cover them fully in this course, um, but I want to talk about generator expressions mainly here because that's easier to understand and we will use it um, throughout the rest of this course. Let's have a look at the range function that we have used so often before within for loops. When I introduced you to the range function, I stated something like this. The range function pretends to return a list of numbers. Okay, that's what we have written somewhere earlier in the lecture notes. And there was a reason why I chose the word pretend here, because it does not return a list of number itself. It actually returns a stream of numbers. And you can see this easily by um, generating a range object in Python like so. So you can, in fact, call range 37 outside any for loops, and it will return something. And this something will be assigned to a vari variable called rng. So let's see what this uh, piece of code here prints out. I take RNG and I convert it to a list using the list command. And I'm going to print RNG and I'm going to print the type of RNG here. And you see what we get uh, when I print RNG itself. Python tells me, well, this is just a range object 3,7. And the type of this object is of a certain class, which is called range. So it's certainly not a list. Okay? It's different from a list. And we can confirm this by also checking what LST itself looks like when we print it. So I'm going to print LST, and I'm also going to print the type of LST. And you see they are intrinsically different. 
So LST is indeed a list with four elements starting at three, and the type of LST is indeed a list. Okay, so different from the range object above. So the range and the list are different. They have different types, but it turns out they contain the same elements. Okay. Because I can just take my range variable like so, and I can put it into a for loop and extract all the elements and print them out. Let's try this. What do I get? I get exactly the same elements that were contained in the list. So the main difference between these two is, just to re-emphasize this here, that RNG itself is an iterator that is capable of providing all the elements one after the other, whereas the list actually contains all the elements and is stored so like this in the computer's memory. So what are the fundamental ingredients of an iterator like range 3.7? It needs to be able to provide a starting value, which is 3 in this case. It needs to know what its increment is. So whenever I call this iterator, it needs to know how to increase the value. And it also needs to know when to stop, right? There's some end value, which is in this case 7. 7 is not included. So in fact, the last number being produced here would be 6. So when we call something like this for x in range 3,7. What happens internally is the following. The for loop itself will ask or query the range iterator for its first element. Range will answer my first element is 3, and this variable 3 is going to be assigned to x. Then we execute um, the body of the function and we just print out 3. In the next round, 4 will query the range function again. So what is your next element? And range will answer, well, my next element is 4. 4 will be assigned to the variable x, and then we execute the body of the function, we'll print out 4, and so on. This happens until um, we have printed out 6. Now, once the iterator has returned the number 6, and we ask again, so what is your next element? The iterator will just say, well, actually, I'm done. I have no more elements to provide, and I stop here. Okay. So the, rain, the for loop will end without further execution of what's in it. So the body will no longer be executed. But this is what happens internally. Now, what, what, is, what are the benefits of iterators? First of all, there is almost no memory requirement for all the elements that we are iterating over. So if you, for example, type this here, you are essentially creating an iterator over a billion entries, right? But at no point in time of your program, you actually need to store these billion numbers in a list. Okay? You might not even have that much memory to store all these numbers. Also, there is no time delay, so the iterator can immediately provide the first number. There is no need to set up the long list of all the elements you want to iterate over. And a side benefit of this is that very often in programs we want to interrupt the for loop. So maybe we intentionally wanted to, originally we wanted to iterate over one billion numbers, but then we decided after four numbers actually we have enough and we want to stop. There is no need to generate all the one billion numbers when we actually don't use them. So that's another benefit of using iterators instead of lists. Now just to emphasize, iterators do not just need to be numbers. They can be any kind of data that is being streamed. So for example, iterators could return one website after the other. Imagine you have a piece of computer code that crawls the internet, okay, visits websites one after the other then you can actually write an iterator that will provide you with one website after the other, starting with the particular one. Okay. So this is much more abstract than the examples that I'm demonstrating at the moment. Iterators can return all sorts of data, not just integers. So how do we write our own generator like the range function? 
that's in fact very simple. They are essentially functions, but instead of using a return keyword, they use a yield keyword. Okay, that's the only difference. So let's look at this example here. It's a generator that returns the prime factors of a number n. Generator is called primes. It takes as input parameter a natural number n. And you already see here that it doesn't have a return statement, but it has a yield command inside the function definition. Now, how does this function work? Well, first of all, we take away the, the sign of that function. And then we go through all the integers p between 2 and n. So we test all possible divisors of the number n. And we ask the question, if n is divisible by p, that's what this here is checking, and in addition p is a prime number. If this is the case, we have just found a prime factor of n. So we want to yield this particular prime factor, not return it. What is the difference between yield and return? Remember, return actually interrupts the function. It executes until that point, And when it leaves, all the information that was stored on the function is being lost. Yield does not do this. Yield merely pauses the function. Okay. So when the interpreter arrives at the statement yield here, it will return the value of p, but not forget all the internal variables that we have available inside the function, which is, for example, this running variable p. It will just exit the function for now, and when it's being asked for the next element, it will just continue at this position where it stopped. Okay, so let's try this. I'm just reusing here the is prime function from before, which takes an in input n and returns true when we have a prime number and false otherwise. And then I'm here asking for some user input integer n. And now I'm using this generator that we have just written inside the for loop. Okay. So this is exactly as we used the range function before, but now I'm not using range, I'm using my own function called primes. So this is a generator and it will return something that we can iterate over Therefore, I can put it inside this for loop. So let's test this. What are the prime factors of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, let's say? Okay, my program just prints them out, one after the other. So we call this generator. We will get in the first round of the loop the first prime factor returned by this yield command. And all this loop here does, it's printing them out. So C and T is a counting variable n is the integer that we are factoring into primes, and prime is the yield of the generator. Okay? So everything that this generator here yields will be assigned to the variable prime one after the other. And you can see the prime factor number one of one, two, three, four, five is three. The second one is five, and then eight, two, three. And using this count variable here, we can also output that we have three distinct prime factors. Just as a small remark, this way of finding prime factors is, of course, very inefficient because I'm essentially trying all possible devices one after the other. Right? And you have probably learned about Euclid's algorithm. That would be a much more efficient way of finding these factors. I'm just doing this here for demonstration. Okay. We can easily convert generators or iterators into lists by using the list uh, function as before. The list function takes any iteratable and makes a list out of it. And it will also work with our own primes generator that we have just written. So I can just type list of primes of n, and that will return a list. As you can see. Okay. 
Now, usually we don't do this because the whole purpose of iterators is exactly to avoid lists, right? to get one element at a time. But if you really insist on having a list, you can do it. You can convert the outputs of a generator to a list. And of course, to tuples and whatever else you might want to have. Okay, so generators are quite an advanced concept. As I mentioned, you can return any sorts of data streams. They will not be part of any of the examinations, but I think it's good for you to know that they exist and there is a link for you to learn more in case you're interested. What are generator expressions? Generator expressions, like generators, are expressions that return iterators. They behave in exactly the same manner, but they have a much more compact syntax they are not defined in terms of functions with the yield keyword. They are defined by a single line of Python code. So here is a generator that will return all the squares of the numbers between 0 and n minus 1. And this is the line that defines that generator. So the syntax is as follows. Uh, we have some parentheses, left and right followed by an expression. So in this case, I want to return square numbers. So the expression to evaluate is, well, square the number x. And now for this to be a list of some elements, we need to loop over x, right? And the way to do this is to use the for keyword. x is the variable we are iterating for, in, and then, for example, the range function. So the range function is a generator, and we can use it within a generator expression. So let's see what is this. Okay, give me the list of all the squares of numbers between, let's say, um, 0 and 5. I'm calling this expression here. I'm generating uh, a generator expression, GEN, and when I output the variable gen ex itself, I get something like this, generator object. Okay. So this is not itself a list, it's just something that can produce numbers one at a time. The type of gen is a generator. And if I really want all the elements of the generator, I can convert it into a list like so. And indeed, we get the list of all the squares uh, for the numbers zero up to four, as expected. Okay, so the general statement is like this, expression, for keyword, variable name, in keyword, and then something to iterate over. The nice thing about generate expressions is that they look very similar in syntax to what we would write in mathematical notation. Okay. So if you wanted to get all the squares of some integers in a range, you would just write gen contains values of x squared for all integers x in that interval, 0 to n, n excluded. Now, compare, these, compare this syntax to this one here. It's very close, right? First, what we want to evaluate, and then 4, and then the range of the arguments we are looping over. Generate expressions can also contain if statements. So here we have a generator expression for squares of numbers which are taken from range n and have the property that x itself is a prime number. And the way to do this is to add another if keyword here and a condition to be true or false, in this case is prime of x will return true when x is indeed a prime number and if this is Satisfied, we will add it to our generator expression um, stream being generated. So let's see what we get here. Unfortunately, I have deleted the is prime function. I need to restore it. So generate all the squares between um, zero and zero squared and five squared where the number being squared is a prime number, well, we get 2 squared, 
3 squared and 5 squared, as we expect. All the squared prime numbers. We could have done this also differently using a simple for loop. So here is my generate expression, exactly the same as we have just discussed, squaring prime numbers. Now I can take this expression and put it into a for loop like so. So I can get all the elements of this generator by looping over y in gen. Right? This will produce exactly a list of numbers like so. But this variable gen is actually not necessary. I can just put it directly into the for loop itself. So I would end up with something like this. For y in some generator expression, print out the number y. Now, is this very nice to read? Probably not, right? I find it quite difficult to, to pass. So, in fact, I would prefer to write the same code like so. Take any number in x, take any number x in range n. We do this in the for loop. Check if this particular x is a prime number, and if it is, then print the square. That's an equivalent way of doing it, and this will produce exactly the same list of numbers. So not always are generator expressions better than using plain for loops. Right? So do it only for readability. Um, not always are they the best solution for a particular task. Now, what else can be done? Um, we can, in fact, generate lists immediately. So instead of first having a generator expression and then converting it to a list, we can use these kind of um, expressions to generate lists in the first place. So here is a piece of Python code that will generate the list of squares of numbers um, of the primes between 0 and n minus 1. Right? So we have a for loop for x in range n. We check if the particular x that we are considering is a prime number. And if it is, we append the square of that number to the list. So after this is completed, we should have a list of squared primes. But we can do the same thing using a so-called list comprehension. So a list comprehension is a generator expression with square brackets. You see I'm not using parentheses here, I have square brackets. And that will do exactly the same thing. It will generate a list of square numbers where x is in range n and x is a prime number. Okay. So these two are equivalent. And of course I need to define what n is. The point is that what comes out of a list comprehension is a list, not a generator expression. Okay, so the only difference is parentheses versus square brackets. That makes the difference between these two. So be very careful. Um, if, for example, n is 1 billion, like so, then this here will work perfectly fine. And as long as I have defined the, uh, the function is prime, of course. Let me just take this away for now. Um, this is just producing now a generator expression of the squares of the first 10 billion or 1 billion numbers. Okay. No problem at all. It executes within a millisecond on my computer. If I change this to square brackets, and I would now actually execute this code, my computer would probably crash because there's not enough memory for storing all these integers in a list. Okay. So very important distinction. So a small change can have a very big effect on your program in this case. Generator expressions can be used in combination with so-called aggregator functions. So what we might want to do is uh, we might want to compute the sum of all the squares of prime numbers between 0 and n minus 1. Okay. We have done this before. We would start with 
some helper variable called sum underscore, let's say, which is initialized at the value 0. Then we would have a for loop over the values x of interest. We would check whether each of these x is a prime number, and if it is, we would increase sum underscore by the square of that prime number. And so this should give the sum of all the squares of the prime numbers. If we have a generator expression that actually returns us all the squares of the prime numbers, we can put this inside the sum function. Okay, so sum of a generator expression will just go through all the elements being generated and sum them up. So we can easily compute the sum of all the squares of the prime numbers between 0 and 4. Somehow I don't like this is prime function. It always gets lost. Like so. Turns out to be 13. Why 13? Because it's uh, 2 squared plus uh, 3 squared, right? It's 13. So the sum function can be used to summon all the elements conveniently. And there are some other functions, for example, any. Any goes through the elements being returned by a generator and checks whether any of them takes on the value true. So here is a small program that checks if any of the squares that we have just generated is itself of the form p plus 2 for some prime number p. How would we do this? Well, first of all, we need to know what numbers we want to test. That's the same generator expression. That's the squares of the primes. And I, what I can do now is I can form a new generator expression using the old one, which was called numbers. I take out one number at a time from this generator, call it number. And now I check if that particular number, minus 2, is itself a prime number. Okay. So we take this list of squared primes. We take out any of these numbers. We take off 2 and then check whether we get a prime number. In this list of numbers, is there any which satisfies that the new number is a prime number? Well, we can find out with this program here. So on the list of squared primes between 0 and 5, is there any that when I take off 2, I get another prime number? And turns out, yes, there is one. We don't really know at the moment which one it is, but there is one. So that's the any function. If we want to know which of these numbers satisfy a condition, we can do this, for example, like so. Here is again the list of candidate numbers. For each number in that list, I check whether number minus 2 is a prime number. And if it is, it is going to be added to a list. This will produce a list of all the numbers, all the prime numbers that when being squared, have the property that when I take off 2, I get another prime number. So here is that particular list. Um, the numbers that satisfy this condition are 4, 9, 20, 5, 49, 169. And a number that doesn't satisfy this condition is 121. Now, why does 121 not satisfy this condition? Well, 121 minus 2 is 119. And that's not a prime number. It can be written as 7 times 17. If we want to check if all elements returned by a generator expression satisfy a certain property, we can use the all keyword. That will return true if all elements evaluate to true. Um, it will return false otherwise. So let's try this. So if I take all the squared prime numbers between uh, 
starting with the elements from 0 to 5, then indeed these have the property, all of them have the property that when you take off 2, you get another prime number. Right? That's why all has evaluated to yes. The condition was true for all these numbers. When I increase this, at some point I will hit numbers where squares minus 2 are no longer prime numbers themselves. Okay. Now, generate expressions have the property that they cannot be rewind, rewind to the beginning. So this particular code here demonstrates that things can go wrong if you make this assumption wrongly. So here is n equals 17 initialized. Again, our list of squared prime numbers. And now I want to check whether a particular number in this list minus 2 is a prime number. And I want to print out the corresponding numbers using a list comprehension, right? That is a list comprehension for the numbers that have a particular property. So, and indeed, it prints out all the numbers that satisfy the property. But then, when I call this list comprehension here, using the same list comprehension numbers again, you see it appears here again, I get an empty list. And that's the wrong result because this list is in fact not empty. The reason is, when Python goes through the generator expression once, when it iterates over all the elements, it's at the end of the list, and it will not go back to the beginning when you call the iterator again. Right? So, in some sense, iterators can only be used once. Once you have iterated through them, you need to recreate them or rewind them manually. Okay? So, this here does not behave as expected for that particular reason. So just to remind you, generator expressions are meant only for single use. They know how to get to the next element, starting from the first, but they do not know how to jump back to the first element. Okay. That's important to, to remember. Okay. List comprehensions can be made even more complicated using, for example, multiple four clauses. So here is an interesting list comprehension which will return all simplified fractions between 0 and 1 with the numerator and denominator between 1 and m. So let's first look at the output of um, this list comprehension. The parameter m is equal to 5. And what we get here are fractions, simplified fractions, where the numerator is between um, 1 and 5. So 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, and so on, up to 5 <coughs> over 5, uh, 4 over 5. 5 over 5 is not included because it's not simplified, right? It would simplify to 1 over 1. How can we create such a list with essentially a single line of Python code? And this is really a single line, but it's only uh, broken into several lines for um, making it easy to read. Okay, so what is the expression we want to evaluate? What are the entries in our list? The entries in our list are going to be strings, so that defines a string, where we have a decimal number in the numerator and a decimal number in the denominator. You can think of D as integers here. So this uses C-like formatting, just to show you one of its usages. So percent %d will, is going to be, be replaced with a number and percent %d is going to be replaced with another number. And these are the numbers I'm going to replace with, n and d. These are the elements in my list comprehension. Now, what is n and d? Well, n ranges between 1 and m, and d ranges between n and m. Okay, so, in particular, uh, D starts counting at N, not at 1 here. But now I need to check whether N and D have no common divisors, right? So whether they are fully simplified. And I do this using an if command here, and this all expression. So let's go through this step by step. I have a k loop 
which starts at 2 and goes up to n plus 1. So this will range from 2 to n. And these are all the possible devices I'm going to check. I'm checking that n is not divisible by k and d is not divisible by k. And I need to check this for all numbers k. If this evaluates to true for all the numbers that I've looked at, then I know they are in simplified form. Therefore, I can include them in my list of strings. Okay. So that is one use of a list comprehension, having two for loops. The same thing can, of course, be achieved by two nested for loops, as we would have done maybe until yesterday. But now, using list comprehensions, we can do this in one line of Python code very easily. Okay, and there are some other um, examples here for you to look at. So it's doing basically the same thing, but now I'm not checking all possible devices. I'm only grabbing out a few of them. So instead of having a range command here, I can as well loop over the elements of a list. For example, I could have the numbers in the numerator to loop over the numbers 1, 3, 5, 7, 11. And I could have the numbers in the denominator to range over 17, 19, 23. Okay. That's also possible. So lists and tuples within list comprehensions are perfectly valid because they are iteratable, so we can iterate over them. The last thing on list comprehensions I would like to mention here is that some of the codes that we have worked on previously in the course can be shortened very significantly. So, for example, if we want to compute the sum of the digits of a number on integer n, say, then what we can do is we can write a for loop over x in string of n. Remember what a for loop over the elements of a string does. It returns you a list of the characters but each character is still uh, a string, right? So it will return you a list of one string uh, characters. Therefore, we need to then convert it into integers. But then we can just use the sum function to sum up all these integers. So let's try this. What's the sum of the digits of n being 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? There we go, that's 15. So that's a one-liner for a program that maybe before was about five or six lines. Let's say we want all the digits of a number which are prime numbers. We could do it this way. Again, we have a for loop over string n, which will loop over all the characters. And we might then check if each of these characters is an element in the string 2, 3, 5, 7. So if we have a single character string representing a number, which is a prime number. It surely is a substring of this string here, right? 2, 3, 5, 7. So we have this if condition here. Now, if all of this is satisfied and true, we can convert the number to an integer and then create a list like so. It's not computing the sum, it's just returning a list of the prime digits. We can of course, get the sum of the prime digits by just putting a sum around the whole thing, sum them up. And we can get all the prime factors as well using a list comprehension, like so. So if we want all the prime factors, what do we need? Well, we need a for loop that goes from 2 up to n minus 1 at most. So these are the candidates. And we'll check if n is divisible by x, in which case this condition here will be true, and also if x is a prime number. Okay. So if these two conditions are satisfied together, that's why we have an end concatenation here, then we want to add x to our list of prime factors. Final remarks, generated expressions do not always speed things up, so only use them when necessary. And in particular, this problem that you can only use them once is uh, sometimes inconvenient. Right? There are, of course, ways around that. 
if you want to learn more about this, this relates to cloning generators, you might have a look in the ITER tools package, which provides provides ways to actually replicate generators and use them multiple times for the same purpose.